Genesis chapter 3, and we left off the deep stuff, right? So what I'm going to do right now is to expound the de deep stuff a little bit because I feel like the last Genesis study was a little rushed. And not only that, I, uh, the bad news was that the onliners, they lost the salient verses I mentioned because the mic was feedback. So please make sure that the sound, it's not clipping back and forth, okay? If it is, please let me know. Okay, so we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. Again, expounding verse 20, uh, I mentioned last time, and you can watch our previous video in case uh, you missed out. In Genesis, I've taught you that Eve was the mother of all living. So taking into account that she was the mother of all living before Cain was born she's called Eve and if you look at Genesis chapter 4 you'll notice that she already was mother of all living so if she's the mother of all living and this is before Cain then this follows the logic that being was here that she must have had some other children beforehand. Now, I want to clarify a thousandth time, and usually onliners don't get this, I do not believe that, okay? I do not believe that, but I am very open to anything that the Bible tries to show. I'm not going to just avoid it. I'm going to teach you even if it's controversial, because that's what you came here, to hear the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So even if it's areas that I deem to be abstract or unsure, I'm going to tell you. But I'm also not going to be an arrogant idiot saying that this is a matter of fact when it's not. I'm going to tell you honestly that I don't know. That is something unsure. So going back here is that this unsure teaching here, this unsure topic, it may be that Eve, she had children and the wor wording of it would show a must, that she must have had children, living people before uh, before Cain was born. So taking into account that there were these strange people that actually existed before, then this might give several explanations here. So if they had children before, where are they? So there are some people who claim that there is a hollow earth. Uh, there are on people online, the atheist most particularly, that says that Gene believes in a hollow earth. I don't, okay? They didn't really do justice in watching the video that they critiqued that. So that's their problem. Uh, but, you know, people don't care about me, so I could care less about them, right? But just in case some onliners might misunderstand, is that there are people who believe in a hollow earth. Me, I don't believe in that, but I believe there is something in there. There is something in there that they, uh, that's onward to the truth. There's something in there that they have. So they believe that there's basically an alien or strange civilization located below the earth, that there's an underworld paradise, advanced technology and city. Now, throughout time, there were people who claimed to go below the earth and then see this underworld realm. One of them is the famous Admiral Byrd diary. So I don't know how much of it is true or false. However, these people claim that there was an underworld civilization. And as much as I don't know, uh, what I do know and what I do believe is that, yes, there was most certainly an underground civilization. That much I do know. Whether, you can, uh, whether it's literally physical or it can be spiritual, but the point is, as much as there's a literal hell below the earth that we believe, there's also a literal, so to speak, civilization below the earth and that's what we call paradise that's what we believe so we believe as bible believing dispensationalists that there was a paradise below the earth now if you uh, know my other teachings i'm not going to expound it here but i've taught you that paradise was below the earth however after jesus christ died on the cross the old testament saints who died remember they didn't go to heaven because they weren't perfect enough. They need the sinless Redeemer, Jesus Christ, to pay the sin in full. 
Then where, were, where did they go all that time? Simple. They went below the earth. They went to an underground civilization. So because of that, that they were at an underground civilization below the earth, we know that there was a paradise below the earth. And the explanation that I'm talking about with uh, if there were e other beings that Eve had, and there were people who lived in the underworld with advanced technology, then what we could say is these could perhaps uh, be referring to uh, Eve's other children before the fall if she did have any, if she did have any. So Eve's other children. So assuming that she had other children before the fall, they may have been the inhabitants in this paradise below the earth. If that's what is known as paradise below the earth, you might recall what is paradise also known as. And I've shown you in the last Genesis study. You compare that with Revelation 2 and Gen... Uh, not Revelation. Yeah, G Revelation 2, Genesis 2, coincidentally, right? So maybe the Lord does things out of coincidence. I don't know. Or there are something significant about numbers. But the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 reflects and mirrors back to back with Revelation 2. Remember, they're both called what? They're both called Paradise and Garden of Eden. Why? Because of the tree of life in the midst of the garden. But then where's that tree of life again? At Revelation 2 it says tree of life in the midst of paradise. So notice that the Garden of Eden is paradise. Well, if paradise was below the earth, like I taught you before, then that means the Garden of Eden sunk down there. How is that possible? How that's possible is because of this angel with the flaming sword. That's the key. Remember, this flaming sword throughout the Bible is mostly a reference to hellfire. I showed you that, which is very interesting. Now, I, I might say that not all the time, but from what I see, whenever the Bible mentions about God using a flaming sword, most of the references, most, I know so, most would be a reference to eternal hellfire. So then, if we add these things together, we're at Genesis, and I showed you at verse 24 that they put the flaming sword where the Garden of Eden was at, then this would explain where it went. So then the Garden of Eden, it went down right here where hell was located. And remember I taught you that below the earth where hell is located, there's a place of comfort, paradise. Now, I've taught you this in previous study, but I won't teach it here. In case some of you are curious, you can look at Luke 16 and then do your homework. In Luke 16, there is no doubt that paradise, where Adam, uh, excuse me, where Abraham and the Old Testament saints went to, that paradise is at the same location where the rich man was burning in hell. It was all at the same location. So there was a place of comfort and there was a place of torment. Okay, so now that I've built up step by step explaining this, uh, explaining a little bit more now, so then who are these strange people, is that if these strange people lived in this civilization below the earth, I mentioned several issues here. Several issue is that if these uh, unknown beings lived uh, below the earth, then did they have access to the above world, right? So that's the question. Did they have access to the above world? Well, I've told you that if they did have access uh, to the above world, then it may be when God put that flaming sword, you notice here, there's still access where you could go in and out, in and out from hell to the earth. Is that possible? Yes, because in the millennium it repeats. The millennium, what you have to understand, is like the Garden of Eden. So, if the millennium is like the Garden of Eden, then why not an open access? We're going to look at Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66. So it may be that these unknown beings, that they went in and out. So I'm going to move toward this side, that way people can see this. So they may have went in and out over here, from hell to above the earth. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 66. 
And then look at the last verse. The Bible says, at verse 23, that way you can see the context. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and one, from one Sabbath to another, shall what? All flesh. So see, everybody on the earth, when they are on the earth to worship God, look what they see in the earth. Verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. Now, isn't this wording hell? For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. If you compare that with Mark chapter 9, that's undoubtedly hell, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And it said hell fire several times at Mark 9. So Isaiah 66 is no doubt about hell. So notice that in the millennium, Isaiah 66 is talking about in the future at the millennium. All flesh around the world are going to come before God to worship Him. But they're going to see people burning in hell. See that? So there's an opening here like I showed you. So there's an open access where people are going to walk around here and they can see people burning in hell. If that's what happens in the millennium. And if you know your Bible, the Bible says the millennium is like the Garden of Eden. That's what the wording says at Isaiah as well. I think it's Isaiah uh, 9 or I forgot. But anyway, in Isaiah, it will mention that. So if the millennium is like the Garden of Eden, then why not an opening just like the millennium does? So it could be that these beings, they went in and out. But obviously, they're not in a place of torment. They're in a place of comfort, as found at Luke 16. Luke 16 says, Paradise was in the same location as hell, where this place is, you're burning forever, this place is a place of comfort. And you're going to see that Luke 16, it's in the same location. Now, returning back, okay, adding all these one-by-one -one details with this deep doctrine, why would I say that they went in and out? Why can I not just say they sunk down there and they were locked up? The reason why is this. The reason why is because of Genesis 4 that I've showed you last Genesis study, which uh, you don't have to turn to. But remember at Genesis 4, God, uh, Cain, uh, Cain said that there's going to be people on the earth who's going to kill me. Why would he say that if he's the only inhabitant with Adam and Eve? So it sounds like there were a bunch of people that time. So that's one. I've also, it shows that they may have been wandering on the earth. If you believe that, then there's going to be answers here, actually, if you believe in this doctrine. If you believe in this doctrine that Adam and Eve had other children before the fall, and they were the ones in this underground civilization or paradise, then it's going to answer several questions. And so I'm going to list it out here. One is where uh, it makes more sense about the repopulation how Cain found his wife and how the sons of God, they intermingled with the daughters of men. So it would make more sense how this process can be done much more quickly. So if you believe that there were more people that time. The second thing, if you believe in this, it'll give the answer to who Melchizedek could be. So I know that Melchizedek, that there are so many different ways to spell this, just put up with this wrong spelling, okay? So Melchizedek, uh, in the Bible at the book of Hebrews, it's, he's a very mysterious person. So what we'll do is we'll go to Hebrews, actually, because we didn't go there last Genesis study. So let's do it justice. We're going to go to Hebrews. Now, this person is a very mysterious creature. Everyone wants to find out who Melchizedek is. Mel uh, I almost said Melchizedek chapter 7. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Melchizedek, notice how he's described when we look at verse 1, at verse 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the, the King James spelling right over here since we're turned over there anyway. The Bible says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings. So whoever this Melchizedek is, he met Abraham before. But this Melchizedek, notice who he's described as. If you look at verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Some people think Melchizedek could be Jesus Christ, but the problem is at verse 3, he's made like Jesus Christ. 
And then if you look at uh, another case to build it up is actually chapter uh, 5, yeah, at 5, verses 5 through 6, verses 5 through 6, Jesus Christ is following that priesthood line of Melchizedek. You notice that? And verses 5 through 6. So because he's following that priesthood line of Melchizedek, it can't be, uh, I doubt it, to be Jesus. Now, I'm going to explain that a bit more when we come to Abraham, all right? So I'm not going to spend too much time on Melchizedek. But point, the matter of fact is this. The point of the matter is not like trying to find the mysterious identity of Melchizedek. It's to give one of its clues related to this area on Genesis 3. Verse 3 shows that Melchizedek, he's basically immortal. That's the point. So then, if Adam and Eve had other children, Melchizedek could have been one of them. That would make a lot of sense. Why? Because remember, the tree of life is in the Garden of Eden, and Revelation 2, in your previous Genesis study, shows that the tree of life is in the paradise where these other beings are at. So because of that, and these people can partake in the tree of life and live forever. Now, the only flaw to this is verse 3. It says, without father, without mother. So then that would contradict Genesis 3. Eve was the mother of all living. So there are pros and cons here. But it is nevertheless one of the more fulfilling answers I see. It's a more fulfilling answer. Because I see throughout the Bible, Melchizedek is not the only one. There are more heavenly strange creatures in your Bible that some people suspect to be Jesus Christ, but there's a good chance he's not Jesus Christ. So then why would they put him as son of God, for example, or immortal? Because of Luke, that's where I didn't show you last time. So that's what the onliners had that feedback in the mic. Go to the book of Luke. And then we're going to look at chapter, uh, I think it's 3. We're going to look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Now, as we look at these other passages here, If, we, uh, if you recall what I said about the sons of God intermingling with the daughters of men, I have no doubt those were fallen angels. However, I also believe that these can include these people, these other children of Adam. You might say, why? Because they are accurately known as sons of God as well. You might say, why so? Because remember, so we're in Eve, now we're in Adam. If you look at Genesis chapter 5 in comparison, we can turn over there. So look, we're going to compare Luke 3 and Genesis 5. We're going to go back and forth. Now, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 5, when it talks about Adam's first child after Cain and Abel, notice that verse, let's see here, verse 3. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in what? His own likeness. So notice that Adam's children, they take after the image of Adam, not the image of God. Now remember, before Adam and Eve fell, okay, Adam was made after whose own image? It was the image of God, right? He was image of God before. But then notice that his children after that are not known as image of God. They take after the image of Adam. Why? Because this is their fallen state. Now, if Adam and Eve had other children before the fall, then this is not their unfallen state. That means they don't have the image of Adam. They would have the image of God. So... That's why the Bible says that if you're a, a human being, that you're known as son of man or sons of man or sons of Adam. You're definitely not known as sons of God unless you're saved. Yeah. See, if you're a lost person, you're definitely not a child of God or a son of God. But why? Because we take the fallen state of Adam, so we're sons of man. But look at Adam before he fell. Before he fell, because he takes the image of God, look at the wording here at Luke chapter... Oh, great. I just lost my... Okay, there's my bookmark. So Luke chapter 3. Notice at verse 38. Verse 38. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the what? Son of God. Ah, so because 
the unfallen state is known as son of God, after the image of God, it makes sense these people can be called sons of God. So they could have intermingled with Adam's human children. So that would make a lot of sense on how Cain found a wife. See right here, the repopulation question would be filled more quickly. How do they find these people to marry and etc. So it'd be easier that way if you are open to this teaching. Returning back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Now I built case by case why this is possible. One is because of the logic and literally believing every word as your verse says at Genesis chapter 3 and uh, verse like here. Uh, verse uh, 20. Yeah, thank you. Verse 20. So following verse no, that's proof that's proof text one. Proof text two is Genesis 4 where Cain mentioned about other people on the earth at verse 14, Genesis 4, 14. The third case is Genesis chapter 1 and verse uh, 28, verse 28. It shows that Adam was in control and dominion over every living thing that would move upon the earth. So that could explain that question. But it also builds up a number four case. A number four thing to know is the command. The command of Genesis 1.28. God told them, okay, this is the command that's prior to, not, to the Garden of Eden, where God says, do not partake in the fruit. There's a command that's sooner than that, and that's repopulating. He told them to repopulate. So basically, the command was sooner to repopulate than to not partake in the forbidden fruit. If that's the case, then their repopulation must have been sooner then. It would follow logically. The fifth case that I showed you is in Genesis chapter 3. The idea, what is the point of a curse? The curse is changing the original state. So if the snake had legs before and he was cursed to crawl on the ground, then what does that mean? He's cursed, which changed his original state before. He had legs before. The curse changed him to crawl on the ground. Adam. He has to work from the ground to earn his uh, fruit and his bread. The curse changed the original state. Why? Because it changed the original state of the ground where he was able to eat the fruit before without working. But now the ground got changed where it's cursed and he has to work out of it this time. So then if that follows with the serpent and with Adam, why not the woman? The curse, what did it change? Her repopulation, so her replenishing bringing forth children. The verse says you're going to bring forth with ch children with sorrow. So what did that do? It changed her original state where she was bringing forth children without sorrow. So that follows number five. The idea is about the curse. The context of the curse also shows it. Now that we've seen pretty much everything, so that should pretty much solve everything over here about these strange creatures. So then what, uh, what gets me going is I wonder if these people, they have a split thing just like the angels up in heaven where they can choose to go God's side or they can choose to go to the devil's side and become his fallen minions. And they're going to be different from humans. You might say why? Because they already partook in the tree of life. So because they partook in the tree of life, it's already too late for them. So they're at an eternal stage. Their eternity is settled. Whereas Adam and Eve did not take it yet. You're going to find that out that they didn't take it yet. God said, I don't want them to eat from the tree of life. Because then they're all going to be lost. That's why angels are different from men. Why? Angels are eternal. Mankind is not eternal. They're temporary. But let's cover that a little bit more later, all right? So we're going to cover that. I assure you we'll cover that today, all right? So let's look at verse 21. All right, learned a lot there? Okay, that should have uh, caught up with everything that the onliners missed out before. Now let's look at verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife. So what did God also do to Adam and his wife Eve? Did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? So God, the Lord God Almighty, he, all he said was this. All he said was that he made coats of skins so that he can clothe them. Now recall this, they were wearing fig leaves, right? Now, 
because they were wearing fig leaves, obviously fig leaves is not appropriate as clothing. <laughs> it doesn't clothe you, it doesn't cover you up as, uh, as thoroughly as it should. And then if you recall the spiritual lesson there, what did I teach you about the spiritual lesson there? Fig leaves were supposed to represent your works. Well then, God replaced their works with something better in clothing. So that's why we can obvious, it's pretty obvious to guess. If you believe spiritual application, which hyper-dispensationalists don't, right? Because they only look at doctrinal, they don't look at spiritual application, they're going to miss the doctrinal application. If you look at spiritual applications behind the Bible, it will lead to something doctrinal. That's one thing I've learned. So the Bible never said at verse 21 that it's a doctrine that I put lambskins on them so that it can represent my son dying for them. He never said that here at verse 21. But you can obviously guess the clothing and you can obviously find the spiritual application to see the doctrinal conclusion that I put lambskins on them because it's supposed to represent my son dying for their sins, which is better than their works of righteousness from their fig leaves. All right, so I've explained the fig leaf concept and I've proven with the verse. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to now prove this has to be lambskin here. Go to Proverbs 27 and Matthew 7. Proverbs 27 and Matthew 7. Now, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, uh, I don't know of people who... Uh, this is so weird. Nearly all of mainstream Christianity, for some of you who don't know, nearly all of mainstream Christianity teaches in the churches that Adam and Eve, they wore lambskins, but they never gave a proof text. They never gave a proof text. So I'm going to give you the proof text, which seems to show it here. All right, now, the first clue is this. The first clue, how we can tell that it was lambskins, is because what is obvious in the Bible, how people get their clothing, is from lambs. That's obvious. That's their mainstream, their main line of clothing. It was from lambs. So look at Matthew 27, verse 26. The Bible says, the lambs are for thy, what? Clothing. And the goats for the price of thy field, so to speak. So that's why we can tell that clothing was obvious. Lamb clothing was obvious during that time. Uh, some critics might say, well, it should have said wool or fleece or something like that. It shouldn't say coats of skin. That doesn't make sense. They're a bunch of dummies. You never heard of lamb skin, sheep skin? It's just pretty much the same thing. Okay, go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Your King James Bible wording is fine. You don't need to update that. Okay? All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Now, you might say, why do you use harsh language on them? The reason why is, why, how dare they correct the Word of God, God's own Word? How dare you do that? No respect given to that type of mentality. It shows that you think that you're smarter than God and you should... You should write the correct word more than the Lord himself. The Lord takes his word seriously. Amen. All right, let's look at Matthew 7. Matthew 7. This is very obvious at verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in what? Sheep's clothing. See, so it was pretty obvious that even uh, rich people that time, religious leaders were rich that time, that mainline clothing that time was from sheep. It was from lamb. That's pretty obvious. But then Jesus put a deeper example here. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. That was genius of him to do that. Jesus, he was a master of uh, parables, of spiritual application and symbols. But the hyper-dispensationalists, they like to avoid the metaphorical stuff, the spiritual interpretations, right? So you have to watch out for that. You have to be open to the spiritual, metaphorical interpretations because then you can find the doctrinal conclusion at the end. Now, uh, understanding that it was sheepskin, now we can obviously, the spiritual application, it's so obvious because let's look at Genesis 4. Context is obvious at Genesis 4. Look at verse 4. How did Abel know that God was pleased with lambs as a sacrifice? How did Abel know that? Verse 4, And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So I don't get that. Uh, verse 2, you'll notice, 
and uh, Genesis 4, 2, and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. So how did Abel, why did Abel prioritize sheep? There are tons of animals he could have prioritized. Number two, why did he offer his sheep as a sacrifice to God? How did he know that? See, Cain and Abel weren't stupid. Okay, they didn't just put guesswork. They knew what the Lord wanted. So that's why it's pretty obvious it was sheep. But another example can be found at Genesis chapter, uh, no, Exodus, excuse me, Exodus 12, Exodus 12. God, what did he want as a sacrifice for atonement of sins, for salvation? It wasn't the fig leaves, their works. It wasn't the fig leaves of their works. So Genesis 3 is a great example of a New Testament salvation displayed right there. So you can show that to an Old Testament Jew. Old Testament Jews, they deny ever a salvation without works. A salvation that's based on the shed blood of the Lamb and the meaning behind it of their Messiah. So you can show them at the beginning of Genesis 3, why did the Lord do that? So you can show that. Exodus 12, Genesis 4, why did the Lord show that was important? Look at Exodus chapter 12, verse uh, 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Notice what the Bible says that at verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn. Verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. A hymn that we sing, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. See, there's a meaning behind that. What, what's the meaning? See, God takes salvation seriously ba bla uh, blazed, based on the blood, based on the blood of the Lamb. That's why we go by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, not your works. So why do people think that, you know, I have to avoid sin, I have to live a good life? You know what that is? That's your fig leaf. And God sees that as insufficient to him. He sees that as insufficient to him. He sees the blood of the lamb. All right, but I'm going to expound that way more at Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel. Cain is the start of all world religions, you, got, you must understand. He is the start of all the world religions. Every religion... I challenge you is this, ev look at every religion in the world. They are based on a work system in some way or form. The only religion that doesn't do that is Bible-believing Christianity. Amen. Isn't that shocking? Amen. So that shows something here. That shows there's a demonic thing, spirit behind all these world religions then. Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 3 and then we'll read verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. So the Lord God is speaking here and he says, behold, which means look or pay attention. So look, I mean, the man, mankind now is now like us. Why? Why, why are they like God? Because they have the knowledge now. They have the knowledge of good and evil. That's why the tree is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Simple as that. So because they have knowledge of good and evil... Remember, if you have knowledge of good and evil, God has to now make you accountable for your actions. I've taught you that in our previous Genesis study, so I'm not going to do that here. So because now they're held accountable for whatever good or evil thing they do, they are no longer, they are no longer in the stage of innocence. Remember, before their fall, they were in the stage of innocence. So that's why God can let them go. They are still saved no matter what. He doesn't have to hold them accountable. But now that they have knowledge of good and evil, God has to make them accountable now. And so when God holds you accountable for your actions, let's be honest, no matter how good your fig leaf of your work is, it's still insufficient. And that's why you need the blood of the lamb as your covering. You need Jesus Christ to pay your debt. Now, understanding that, Look what God does. So now that they're held accountable for sin, so they're held accountable for sin now, for their actions. 
So then God has to do something. He's going to do something merciful. It's not punishment. It's out of mercy. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. See, I told you so. They didn't eat the tree of life yet. So basically the interpretation is God saying, so now before they, unless they, uh, he takes out his hand and then takes from the fruit off the tree of life and then he eats out of it and then he lives forever, what does the Lord do? Verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden. So what did God do is that he drove out mankind from the garden of Eden. Remember the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And Revelation 2 says, what tree of life in the midst of paradise? So this builds up a case a lot more. The garden of Eden went down there. But uh, I showed you at Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel showed you really, I mean, uh, it showed you that the garden of Eden went down to hell which is pretty interesting. Now, anyways, returning to our text here. So God does this out of mercy. Now, connecting that with the deep doctrine here. If it connected with uh, the pre-Adamic, let's just pull it pre-Adamic. If it connected with these pre-Adamic beings, They ate from the tree of life because it's in the midst of the Garden of Eden where they're at and they partook in that. Then that means if Satan gets them and they follow his system, they're already at an eternal state. Their eternity is settled where it's corrupted by Satan. So their eternity is corrupted and hence they become like fallen demons, so to speak, or fallen angels. So then they join the devil's side. If Adam and Eve were already corrupted. All Satan had to do next was now eat from the tree of life. But then God's not going to let the devil do that. He says, okay, I'm going to get you out of the Garden of Eden so that you don't eat that tree of life. Why? Then you're going to be at a forever fallen state. There's a proof text here that shows this. Go to Revelation 22. That's the proof text. You know who can partake in the tree of life? This should be eye-opening to you. The ones who can partake in the tree of life are those who are in a clean state, okay? The ones who are unclean are not supposed to take in the tree of life. That's important to understand. So clean versus unclean concerning about the tree of life. That's the proof text. Look at Revelation 22. Notice at verse 14. The Bible says, Blessed are they that do His commandments. See, those who are clean, that they may have right to the what? Tree of life. Did Adam and Eve follow God's commandment or did they break His commandment? They broke His commandment. So then they don't have right to the tree of life. Because what happens? Uh, and may enter in through the gates of the city, right? At verse 14, it could be this one right here. See, the heavenly city. They can have access to this. For without, see that? Those who do not qualify the clean realm, the ones who are outside of this, who have no right to the tree of life, are what? See the unclean, dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth them make a, a lie. Notice sinners cannot partake in the tree of life. See, that's the proof text here that why God drove them out is because they're in sin. And because they're in sin, they're not supposed to partake in the tree of life. Otherwise, what? Without our dogs, without the, uh, if you're outside of the tree of life right here, if you're outside and you do not partake in that, uh, you have no right to this, then you're considered the unclean. But if you have the unclean, take that tree of life, what's going to happen? That's a problem right there to the Lord. So then they can live out for eternity. Tree of life is supposed to be eternal, you have to understand. And then without, verse 15, the sinners, right? So if these sinners partook in that tree of life, get the eternity, that'd be horrifying. That'd be a horrible mess. Okay, let's go back. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3, and then we're going to look at verse 23. Now, this is interesting. Notice here at verse 23, 
The Lord, uh, therefore the Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. So the Lord got Adam and Eve out of the garden. Why? To till the ground from whence he was taken. Ah, notice here that Adam and Eve, the direction that they were going out of here, when they were getting out of town, it was at from the ground from whence he was taken. That's the wording right there. Wait a minute. To till the ground, so he has to till this ground. He has to work in this ground to get his food. But it says from whence he was taken. Ah, so that means when Adam was created, he wasn't created from the Garden of Eden. He was created at a, a terrain that was near the Garden of Eden. But God moved him from that terrain into the Garden of Eden. Did you recall my previous teaching in Genesis 2? Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. That's why it's very possible that Adam, that he was from a golden state before. Why? Because he's from the image of God. The image of God is supposed to have a golden glow, remember? Or did you forget that in the previous Genesis teaching? 1 Corinthians 15 showed you that. Genesis chapter 2 shows the gold in the ground. That's near the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2 also showed you Adam was created from the ground that's not in the Garden of Eden. He was actually moved to the Garden of Eden. But now he's returning back to the ground where the Lord took him out. So Genesis chapter 2, fresh review. Notice at verse uh, 8. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he what? Put the man whom he had formed. But notice his uh, form and creation is at verse 6 and 7. See that? He wasn't in the Garden of Eden at 6 and 7. Verse 8, he was moved to the Garden of Eden after he was created. So it was from the ground where he came. What's the ground nearby? What is the ground nearby Eden? It shows you, verse 10. A river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is bdellium and the onyx stone. See that? But remember, Lucifer was also created what? With the gold, the onyx stone, and all those minerals too. See? And he also had access to the Garden of Eden. I showed you that at Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. See, Adam is... It's, there's no doubt. It's repeating the pattern where God did what God did with Lucifer. So, Adam is returning to this place right here. And he has to work from that ground where he was taken. So, he lost his golden image. Remember, uh, he, he is now in a fallen state. So, he fell from the image of God. So, he lost that golden image. Now, he's in a what? Clay. Image of clay. Image of clay. All right. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Verse 24, so he drove out the man, so God drove out uh, Adam and Eve. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. So what God did was he drove out the man and then he put at the east of the Garden of Eden, notice cherubims here, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So he drove out the man at the east direction of the Garden of Eden, he put cherubims, plural, so there's multiple cherubims, but then he put a flaming sword that turned every way in the Garden of Eden. Why? It's to protect what? The tree of life. That's big to the Lord. What was really big to the Lord what was, was the tree of life. What better way than hell fire surrounding it and then put it at a place where people cannot have access? especially since paradise is also called Garden of Eden, and especially since the Bible showed you Revelation 2 and Genesis 2, that the tree of life is in the midst of the Garden of Eden or in the midst of the paradise of God. See, what better way? Now, uh, understanding that, that's how the Lord uh, protected mankind and he drove them out. Now, notice the direction of the Garden of Eden here. The direction of the Garden of Eden, if God put this 
at the, uh, he drove out the man and he put man at the east of the garden. Then notice right here, Adam and Eve go west to east. So I know I did this wrong. I did east to west, all right? But basically it should be done with west to east. So if Adam and Eve went west to east, onliners, please, don't correct me. I already know. I told you, okay? Onliners don't really pay attention, okay? So this is wrong, I know, okay? This is just a, a pictorial representation. So why do we say west to east? The reason why is because God put the cherubim east of the garden, right? That's what he mentioned, right? East, he put cherubims and a flaming sword. He has to put them east. Why? So that you can't enter this way. So that makes sense that Adam and Eve had to go this way. See that? Why? Because if they try to enter, they're going to try to enter the east of the garden. Okay? So that's why they went uh, west to east. So they went west to east. So let's see. West to east this way. Yeah. <laughs> that arrow really confused me there. So then they went west to east. Now, in your Bible, this is very important to know, okay? This is very important to know. In your Bible, generally, generally in your Bible and in history, west to east is a wrong direction to go. The direction to go is actually uh, east to west. That's the, actually the Lord's way of moving is actually east to west. So that's generally known throughout history and in the Bible. I'm going to give you a quote from Dr. Upman's Genesis commentary, which is pretty enlightening. Adam and Eve go west to east, and this, of course, in the Bible, becomes the standard direction for a tragic or false move. He mentioned here, which is interesting, if Hitler and Napoleon had believed the word, neither would have undertaken his campaign. The only major successful invasion of west, west to east was the conquest of Asia Minor, Persia, and India by Alexander the Great. And guess what happened to him? And he did not make it home. <laughs> he died in a drunken fit at 33 and one and a half years of age. Now that's pretty interesting, right? So you can see west to east is known generally as a bad direction. Cain is driven out west to east, for some of you who didn't know. Jacob, lur uh, Jacob, lurks. Jacob serves Laban while he is in a backslidden state and he goes west to east to get to Laban. The Jews go into captivity west to east. And the Holy Spirit forbids the gospel to move in this direction, which is with Paul when he wants to go to Macedonia, west to east. Conversely, Abraham is called out east to west. The Jews enter the promised land east to west. The entrance into the tabernacle which is supposed to picture heaven, is the direction of what? East to west. Christ returns to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. So, when he comes again, east to west. And the Jews return from captivity, east to west. The rule is not infallible 100% of the time, but the exception proves the rule. The only military operations west to east that work are where the invader is north, of the other country, but there is not time to go into all that here. So that would have been interesting, right? But anyways, the point is that's the uh, general direction to go. All right, you want to know that. That's a rule of thumb in your Bible. And in, in your life, you probably want to keep that in mind too. Is that now, obviously not all the time, right? Sometimes the Lord can call you to go from west to east sometimes, right? So sometimes uh, the Lord will call you there. But generally, it's a bad direction to go. So you want to keep that in mind, all right? Call me, uh, call me like a, a superstitious, but actually from what I see in history and the Bible, that tends to be a wrong direction. It's as if I'm suspicious with 666. Back then, that was my mistake. I said, no, it's okay. The Lord, the Lord will understand, Brother Robert. And we bought an equipment technology price for 666. That's the reason why we had technological issues, onliners. So I regretted that ever since. I know, that was a dumb move on my part. <laughs> Brother Robert's like, should I buy a candy bar, Pastor, with this technology so that we can go a little bit higher, 667 or something? So that was my mistake. So call me superstitious, but one thing I've learned is whatever I see a pattern in the Bible, I want to go by that. Yeah, amen, 
All right. Uh, how did I come over here? You know, I came here from east to west from PBI. My schooling, I didn't stay there. I went to West California, and the Lord blessed it with much fruit. Now uh, let's look at uh, verse chapter four, verse one. Here we go. And yeah, okay, I'll fit, I'll squeeze this one in. But uh, I won't be able to cover the other interesting parts from 3 to 7. Those are really good stuff. Rich um, about religion, Cain's religion. So I don't want you to miss that one. But I'll do the interesting part about superfecundation, whatever that means, right? <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived. Okay, for some of you who don't know, the, the word knew or to know, when it's a man and a woman, it's basically something sexual. I mean, you, that's even uh, indicated, right, in relationships. I want to get to know her, you know, I want to get to know him, etc. So if you look at a lot of other English literature too, uh, getting to know somebody from a man to a woman perspective or woman to man, that's something sexual. So Adam and you, Eve is wife and she conceived. So obviously she uh, brought forth a child from her sexual encounter with Adam. Now why do I emphasize that? because it's mentioned one time. That's important, okay? The sexual encounter between these two is mentioned once. Now go by scripture with scripture, okay? One plus one equals two, okay? It's that simple. People don't wanna go one plus one equals two. They can only count to one and that's it. They can't go one plus one plus one plus one they can't do that four times, it's too much for their heads. But it's actually that simple if you count one plus one plus one and then follow logically. So that's what we're gonna do. So one, sex one time, right? So she conceived, all right. Sex one time, conception is mentioned once here. You notice that? What does that mean? All right, I know this is baby talk, but people don't get this, okay? And they accuse me of being a heretic. She, she conceived one, we counted one, one so far. Can we agree? Okay, look at this. And bare Cain, so she brought forth the son Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Okay, that was a mistake she said. So she brought forth the son named Cain and she automatically assumed, I got this man from the Lord, but that's not true. Look at 1 John 3, 1 John 3. Notice Cain, he is not from the Lord. He is from that wicked one, the Bible says. Look at 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3. Why did Eve say that, Pastor? Because remember the promise of Genesis 3? God said, hey, uh, Eve, from the seed of a woman, it's going to bruise the head of the serpent. So see, Eve was looking so much forward to that. But in her uh, wrong anticipation, it became something that's dreadful. It became her nightmare later on about her firstborn Cain. Notice 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says at verse 12, Not as Cain, who was what? Of that wicked one, and slew his brother. So notice that he's a child of the devil. So uh, keep that in mind. Cain is a child of the devil. Okay, that kind of goes back to... Uh, what I taught you in the previous teaching of Genesis 3 about the seed of the serpent, right? So this may be possible here, okay? So, but we're adding all this, 1 plus 1 plus 1, okay? Going back to Genesis 4, and let's wrap this up so that I can get you out of here. Notice in verse 2, And Adam knew... Eve his wife again, and she again bare his brother Abel. Did I read that right? No. And she what? Again bare. See, she brought forth again. So after she brought forth Cain, all of a sudden she brought forth again another son, his brother Abel. Now, let's use common sense. What does that mean then? It's a twin birth. All right? People say, no, where'd you get that from? No. Just read your Bible, okay? Right here, the sexual encounter is once, and then the conception is not once, it's twice now. So the bringing forth, the bringing forth a child, all right? So let's put it more accurately right here. So it's actually bringing forth a child. 
or birthing, right? So it's mentioned twice now. You see that here? Okay, now here's something that we're going to have to add here. I mentioned possibly Cain's the son of the devil, right? You might say, why is that? Because don't forget Genesis 3. The serpent did something funny with Eve, okay? And it was a physical line that's mentioned. The seed of the serpent versus the seed of the woman here. See that? So there's a physical line somewhere, which is very strange. And the serpent did something funny with Eve. If, 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 okay, I said if, if Eve did have some kind of sexual encounter with Satan that was more physical and then she conceived a child Cain from that, then how is it possible that you get an innocent child named Abel, right? That could be from the good bloodline, which is the seed of the woman from Adam and Eve. The, that's a scientific fact called superfecundation. See that? You can get twin births from two different fathers. So some people don't know that, but that is a scientific fact. So you can get twin births from two different fathers. So because of that, that would give the explanation to how Cain can be a separate bloodline from Abel who is from a separate bloodline himself. So that would give the explanation. Okay, so we finished right here with the deep doctrine. Now, uh, uh, the next time, two, three, four, five, six, seven is my favorite parts because it's talking one of the most important things. It's about the issue of salvation. It is the birth to all world religions today. It is the birth of Satan's religion, his uh, messed up ideology of religion. And you'll see that ever since the beginning of B.C. through the uh, end of time, how Satan worked out Cain's religion and Cain's system. Let's pray. God, my Father, I pray that today's Genesis teachings were a blessing to the hearers. We increased our knowledge of the scriptures. Dismiss us now with your blessing, and I pray that uh, we'll continue to feed and grow in all knowledge and truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.